So, hang on. Let me get my paper clip out of the way. Let me get myself all going here. So I think we did verses one and two, and it says, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, the disciples came to him. And if you go back to chapter four, verse 25, which is the last verse, and it talks about the crowds following him. I think from 23 to 25, talks about the crowds following him. And it's like he goes up on the mountain there to um, kind of get away, get a little room between him and the crowds. And... Um, so it says, seeing the crowds in verse one, he says, uh, he went up on the mountain and when he sat down, the disciples came to him. And this got into the thing I think that we talked about. Who was he speaking to? Who did he give the Sermon on the Mount to? And I think I made the case that he's giving it to the disciples because the disciples are the one who eventually he gave the, um, you know, the office of the keys to uh, forgive sin and to um, uh, to, uh, you know, hang on, you know, hang on to sin, that he gave the uh, sacrament of the supper and the baptism for them to pick and choose, you know, who, um, who could do it. And he gave the great commission to it. Now the crowds are there, and I think the crowds get to overhear it because the message is to overhear. And it's the same thing for us. He gave the Sermon on the Mount to the disciples you know, it's like all scripture is not written to us, but it's written for us. So we're kind of like that crowd. We're overhearing what he's telling the, you know, what he's telling the disciples. So it says that he um, says in verse two, he opened his mouth and taught them saying, I think that's an odd way to put it, isn't it? You know, he opened his mouth. That's that's the way you talk, you know. You have to open your mouth to talk, but he's he's got it. Um, he's got it in there. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." So that's first beatitude. Seems simple, but what's a blessing? What what is a blessing? Okay, gift from God. I mean, we we bless each other. Somebody here, please sneeze so I can bless. No, <laughs> no. But I mean, we 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 bless each other. You know, when we say that, what do, what is it that we're trying to bestow on people? Goodwill. Goodwill. There you go. I mean, that's peace. pardon peace. Peace. Yeah, all those things. Whatever it is that's wrapped up in that word blessed. First of all, it's all good. You know, we don't we don't throw in bad stuff in the definition of the word um, <clears throat> the word blessed. Uh, and I think I said this last week that they're not commands; that they are actually that they're all blessings. They're all gospel. They're all from Jesus. And I think the easiest way to put it is that if you are in Christ, this is who you are. This isn't what he's trying to get you to do. It's not where, well, it's a progress. You know, I'm going to work the rest of my life because I'm in Christ to do this. He's saying, if you're in Christ, that's who you are. You know, he, he's making a pronouncement, you know, that's, um, you know, on them. So that's for those who are in Christ. Um, how does the world describe People who are blessed. How does the world describe who's blessed? Those who have much. What? Those who have much. Those who have much. Is that what you said? Much? Yeah, those who have much. Those who seem to be succeeding in life. You know? You go down to the new Riviera place down there, you know, where they're building all those big new houses. Oh, those people must be so blessed. I mean, they've, you know, I mean, but <laughs> they might have the biggest indigestion problems and ulcer problems and uh, anxiety because, one, they have to pay for the darn place, <laughs> you know, okay. But we like to think that, oh, those people, that's who God has blessed. 
And obviously, those who don't have that are not blessed. Joe. Yeah, I think that's really on. I think that's really a secular misgiving. <laughs> I um, think so. <laughs> because if you look at, for instance, the history of uh, the lotto winners and how a large majority of those lives are destroyed by being blessed, quote unquote, okay, in a secular sense. Yeah. But I think you would ask what what blessing was, and I thought that the term love was the best thing there is. You're showing love, and if you look at that definition of love from First Corinthians, you know, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, does not vote. This yeah. is what you're sharing or projecting towards your neighbor. Yeah. Okay, it's countercultural. You know the. Um, Really, the whole Sermon on the Mount, but especially the Beatitudes, they're countercultural. They're just like, it's like, we think this, but this is where God wants us to, you know, wants us to think, you know, and who, you know, we, who we are. You know, because when, when it says, uh, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, when you read poor in spirit, because this is like in our culture, you think poor in anything is a negative. I mean, you, that's just the way that we first, um, that's the way that we first think, you know, and we think that, no, we've got to gain. So now we're not poor in spirit, but we're great in spirit. Mm -hmm. See? But see, I think what, um, you know, what uh, the poor in spirit, I, I think that Jesus has you know, a, a particular thing, like, and I think we may have read this in comparison to a different question last week, but the, in Luke 18, and I've got it on your sheet, and the reason that you've got three pages today is I broke out all the extra verses so we don't have to go flipping around through, um, you know, through the, through the Bible, you know, to find them. But then he says, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. And that's a big deal because that's what we do. When we think we've got it together, one, we think more of ourselves. I mean, hey, but we think less of others. Why can't you, Dick, why can't you get it together and be spiritual like me? You know? And well, would you write me a would you write me a paper about it, please? And then turn it in next week. No, but that's what that's what that's what we do. He says two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus: "God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector." Well, I don't know those tax collectors. I don't know how much respect I have for them either. But we'll move on from that. <laughs> I fast twice a week. I give all uh, I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, "God, be merciful to me, a sinner." I tell you that this man went down from his house justified, rather than the others. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, in that key, ver the key passage there is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that's probably the best definition you're going to get for poor in spirit, is that recognition of who you are. And that's hard. I mean, it, it really is, because you can always look down at people that you think got it worse than or, or doing worse than you, and we don't humble ourselves that way. And so, how many times we not be we not, may not be as blatant as the Pharisee in this, you know, in this passage, but you know, we could probably make excuses for ourselves pretty good, so that we <laughs> we do. That's what Joe said. We do, you know, like that. instead of just humbly coming up and saying, you know, um, you know, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And leaving it at that, you know, and, and doing. So, so it said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we talked a little bit about that last week, is what is the kingdom of heaven? And we kind of went around the room and people, 
you know, gave their um, gave their things. I might next week. I didn't have time this week to develop it further, but I might uh, next week is do like the first half of the class on the kingdom of heaven, because it's all over the scripture. It seems to be the main point of Jesus's preaching. You know, and so what does it mean to us? What does it mean when he says the kingdom of heaven is in your midst? Or what do we say? We prayed Lord's Prayer today, you know, about your kingdom. May it be on earth like it is in heaven. What do we expect to see? I mean, what if the prayer gets answered? What Do we know what we should expect to see? Or is it well, no, the kingdom has come to the earth and you don't recognize it. <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of, and in the parables, you know, in the parables, Jesus starts out many of the parables, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he uses all these crazy little stories, like a mustard seed, you know, that uh, is the smallest of seeds, but grows into a big bush and the birds, you know, dwell in it. Okay, what's what's that telling me? <laughs> you know, and Jesus said, well, I just told you what the kingdom's like. You know? <laughs> right, so maybe we'll take the first half of the class uh, next week to um, do that. Here's another thing. I, I, I never noticed this before. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay? And then in one of the later verses, I think around 10, it says basically the same thing about the kingdom. You know? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And all of the ones in between, like if you look at uh, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And it's like, well, wait a minute, is that kingdom, you know, blessed are those for the kingdom of heaven, um, what did it say? Uh, for, the, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That sounds present tense. And all the other ones sound future tense. Mm -hmm. Pardon? They shall. Yeah, they shall. That sounds like it's a future tense, but the, the promises for the kingdom seem to be a present tense. Mm -hmm. At least that's the way I read it. I mean, does anybody have a different the version that says, for they shall be under. Oh, no. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I mean, does anybody have a trans... Of course, I passed out all the things so nobody's got their Bibles open. But, you know, see, that's the thing. I think it's something to consider, that it's a present tense, but we'll talk about that. Um, we can talk about that next time. Any hands up before I go on, Howard? Okay. Verse 4, he says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I, you know, what kind of mourning is this, you think? Me. Pardon? Me. You, uh, Hudson, past the year of uh, the anniversary of, um, you know, Ashley passing, you know, like that, that's mourning, you know, I got, but I think in this case, um, and I've got it in your notes, so if you find yourself poor in spirit, like the last verse, and blessed by God, you will find yourself mourning over evil and sin, over evil and sin in your own life, you know? I mean, here I am. I'm already poor in spirit. Got these promises from God. It makes me think how much more sorry, repentant, whatever it is, that I should be over any, you know, evil and sin in my life. Or even evil and sin that I cause others to have in, you know, in their life. And there's a lot of things that we can do that... Um, I mean, just making somebody mad at you <laughs> that causes sin. Pardon? Oh, Ray. I was just wondering if these were stair steps or if they were things for mental one leading into the other one. I don't know that they're stair step because that makes it sound like a progression, you know, like you're climbing a ladder, you know, that... Um, but I, I imagine that there's probably a progression that he's going through. Will you tell us after we read through them? I mean, we'll read through them. And, you know, at least those first two does sound that one, you know, leads to, you know, yeah. leads to the other. 
So it says, for they shall be comforted. And I have listed there the Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 passage showing that God is that comfort. And in that it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, see, if we stopped reading right there, that's what Jesus read in the synagogue when it said that he was up in um, Nazareth or you know wherever he was from, and he said he went to the synagogue, and it was his day to read, and they handed him the scroll, which had to be the scroll of Isaiah because he read he read this, but he didn't read the whole thing. He stopped in the middle of verse 2 there because that's what his prophetic uh, mission was on earth and that the rest would come, you know, later. But anyway, moving on. That was just a side note. To proclaim the Lord, of, uh, the uh, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. And that's what he's there for, is to comfort all those who mourn. But that's coming at a later, you know, at a later time. To grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, uh, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. Um, instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So he's taking those who have mourned. It says he's giving them a fancy headdress, because what did you do when you were mourning? You sat cloth and ashes on your, you know, your head. So it's talking about how he's, for those who mourn, he's going to give comfort, and he's going to change that whole, whole perspective um, around. So who's going to do the comforting? Christ. The comfort comes in God. Where do people look for comfort? You know, sex, drugs, alcohol, whatever it is, party life. Everything. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, whatever. You know, I got. I got to. I got to watch how I say this. Whatever it takes to ease the pain, we consume on ourselves. You can't figure out why the pain doesn't go away because we're not looking for the Lord to be the comforter. And that's not a, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's hard, to, it's hard to remember those things when you're going through trouble. You know, you just want to, you know, stop it all now. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians 1 listed there. Blessed be, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comforts. So now you have an Old Testament passage in Isaiah. Now you have the New Testament passage in, um, in Corinthians from Paul. <clears throat> Who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to, com to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. That was a tongue twister. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but the idea is, is that God's going to eventually comfort. You know, he'll comfort Hudson in his grief, and Hudson in turn will be able to comfort others because of the experience he has with the grief and the experience he has with the comfort. And that's what we all need to be looking for. Or when we get gifts from God, do we pass those gifts you know, through us onto others? Or do we just save those up and consume them on ourselves like we do, you know, the drugs and alcohol and you know, whatever that we just think that it's um, for us. Any questions before we go to the next one? Okay. Blessed are the meek. <clears throat> excuse me. 
Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So we have poor in spirit, you know, being our relationship with God. This is this is my under trying to understand it, how it how it works. If you have a better understanding, that's good. But that the poor in spirit is our relationship with God, and the meekness is our relationship with each other. You know, that realizing that other people have issues have their own dealings with God in our meekness. I mean, we may help them, but it's in our, you know, it's in our, it's in our meekness, you know, uh, you know, meekness is humble in recognition that we too are sinners. But what do people, what do people think of meekness? I mean, when you say somebody's meek, what are you, what's losers. normal? Yeah. Losers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pardon? Weak. Weak. Yeah, just, I mean, just, um, uh, just afraid, afraid. afraid, afraid <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, Casper Miltos, that's what we know. But that's not what, that you know, that's not what it is. You know, it it's not like we walk with our heads down, but we realize even in our shortcomings, we have power in Jesus to be his church and do his work. You know, we, we realize that it's through him. So we're meek in realizing that it's not through us. You know, and that's probably the biggest problem that people have, Lord, like TV preachers. I mean, not just preachers who are on TV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but our definition of TV preachers is like they've done it all themselves. And if you send me money, I'll do more. <laughs> okay, but I mean, is that, they aren't meek at all. You know, they're um, they're bold and they take the credit and they talk about, well, they're the ones who will say it because God has blessed me and my church. And that may not be, it might be the devil blessing his, you know, his work in his church. Denny, do the microphone, pass, it, pass him a microphone. Make sure it's on, heard it on. Maybe. Blessed are the humble. I'm sorry, say it again. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the humble. Meek, I think, oh, being humble. humble. Being humble. Yeah. God. Right. Well, then see that. Well, that's that's probably the biggest part is to give God the glory. You know, but but even then people do it pridefully. Oh, you know, don't applaud me. <laughs> <laughs> but give the glory, but give the glory to God, <laughs> you know, like that. A real humbleness. I mean, it's it's very unique to find a real meekness, um, a real even a people that are poor in spirit. I mean, off the top of your head, can you think of people that are? Usually, you can't because they're not in the limelight to be seen. You know, in what they. You know, in what they do. So, like I say, these things aren't easy. They're, but they're not something you work on. I mean, consciously, how do you how do you work on that? You know, I mean, how do you work on being meek? Staying in God's word. No, well, no, I mean, I, <laughs> no, the, yeah, but that, yeah, but even then, it's like. You know, you could be meek like me if you spend enough time in God's yeah. word. <laughs> Sounds like I don't want to be meek. Like <laughs> no, yeah, you know, I mean, it's and again, so I think what I think what Matthew said, I think what Jesus is saying is that this is who you are because this is the way Jesus sees you. You know, regardless of how you actually, you know, actually are. You know, it goes back, well, I shouldn't say it goes back, because this is like 20 chapters ahead. You know, if you've ever noticed in the parable of the sheep and the goat, goats, okay, is that Jesus returns to earth for judgment, right? And it says that he separates the sheep from the goats. He's not doing any review of people or anything. He knows who knows? Because they're his people. 
You know, not because of what they did, because what they did, what he said that they did, they didn't even know that they did. You know, Be, you know, when he's talking to the sheep, he says, you know, because you have, and then they say, when did I do? Yeah, when when did you see that I did that? They, I mean, because they are he, meek and humble and poor in spirit. They don't even know that that's pouring out of them naturally, you know. And then when he gets to the goats, you know, you go, wait a minute, Jesus, you didn't ask me anything of which side I wanted to be on or give me a chance to explain, um, you know. He said he says to them the same things. Because you did or didn't do, you know, when did we do when didn't we do that? Because these are like the Pharisees. We did everything. But in Jesus' eyes, they didn't do anything because they didn't do it for the right motives. They didn't do it for the right reasons. They did it to consume upon themselves. And so he says you'll go off into, you know, eternal, you know, hellfire and punishment and, you know, all that stuff. And this is when he talks to, you know, to, to us today, and we say, am I like that? Or what do I got to do to get better at that? And it's just a matter, you probably are that way. You just don't realize. You just don't realize the times that you're doing the good stuff, that you just do it. You know, you're walking through Walmart, and there's somebody in a, one of those electric carts and you can just see them looking on the top shelf and you walk by you can i reach that you know for you you don't, you don't even give it a second thought i mean you just you know, i would say god made me tall so i can reach top shelves and he made you short so that you can get me the stuff on the bottom but you just do it and you move on you're not thinking about it and <laughs> Although I tease with people and say, well, I got my good deed out of the way for the day, so now I can go back to being rotten, you know. <laughs> But yeah, but I mean, the number of times that you do things like that, that you don't even give a second thought to, sure. you know, that you're doing them. So, <clears throat> so that's the, um, let's see. Uh, I've got that Psalm 37, 11, where he says, but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. And I think that's important because this isn't Jesus just making this up on the, you know, the mountain there, you know, in a beatitude, something he's, he's quoting it out of the Psalms. This has always been around. This shouldn't be new to you. Yeah. Now this, I have no idea. I have no idea what it means to inherit the earth. I mean, I, you know, it's one of those things you could read. You can look at the commentaries and everybody's going to tell you, something different do we want to inherit the earth is that a good thing to inherit the earth i mean if i want to inherit my parents seventy thousand acre ranch in montana i'll take that but i don't think that that's what he's you know what do we normally think we want to inherit well no. <laughs> okay i'm going to mark joe down as being too much like me but <laughs> no but when you think about inheriting heaven Yeah, but here he's saying you're going to inherit. You're going to inherit the earth, uh, Joe. Yeah, but that's the way I've always looked at that particular scripture. Is inheritance is something in the future, otherwise it would mm -hmm. already be yours. Okay, so inheritance is something in the future, and so the inheritance is the new earth and the new heaven. Right? Yeah. 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 But he doesn't say the new heaven and the new earth. But maybe I haven't got that far in his preaching yet to have preached any of, you know, preached any of that. Do you really you know? want to inherit the earth? No, that's what that's that's what I'm saying. You go, eh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Do you have to pay property taxes on it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I mean, you know, a lot of these things aren't easy, and you look other places where it may have come up, like Joe said, the new heaven and the new earth. You know, and we will be. I mean, we will be here on earth. Whether we get to, you know, whether how much movement there is between heaven and earth, you know, how much of that is, you know, symbolism of just the bliss you're going to have with Jesus, you know.
but that's definitely um you know something you know something different so um let's see where are we at blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied how much do we hunger and thirst for anything spiritual when things are going normal when things are going normal things are going good life's good you know how much do we hunger and thirst for things of the spirit when things are going good, that's shelf time. We want to put God on the shelf. Don't bother. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, don't worry, God. I got this one covered. <laughs> you know, <laughs> call you when I call you when I need you. But he seems to make it sound like um, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Like it should be a permanent, or no, that's not about the right word, full time. You know, full time kind of thing. Well, let's do Joe, then we'll do Ray. Full time. That's what sanctification is. In yeah. other words, if you believe, you do seek the the gifts of God, which is the, the search for the righteousness, and it's unattainable uh, in this environment, secular environment. Yeah. It will be attained when you are received by Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying, yeah, I, I'm listening and I understand what you're saying. I I don't know. Yeah, I'm working through all this stuff too. You know, this is the thing, is that as you go through this, because it's a continual thing, did I understand that properly? And can I see the fruit? Well, we don't see our own fruit. That's the, that's the problem. You know, we, others will see our fruit, you know? And I, I think I was talking about this a little bit at the uh, Masters Men uh, the other day about my wife. You know, she's gone through all this stuff with her back and her surgeries and this and physical therapy. And she thinks she's making no progress at all because she's in pain. I tell her all the things that she does now that a month ago she wasn't doing at all. And when I tell her that, she recognizes it and soon puts it behind her and you know, forgets it. But see, that's what she can't see the fruit in her life, but others see the fruit. I mean, in her case about the injury, but I'm, I'm just saying that, but that's the way it is. So a lot of times we don't think maybe we are hungering and thirsting after that righteousness more than we, you know, more than we think. and other people see you. And then we, we start beating ourselves up over it. I'm not doing enough, but other people, they think Man, I've seen a change in that guy in the last year. Let me get let me get to Ray first. Okay, I'll come back. Could we say that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, in other words, do not receive justice? None of them none of us seek justice for ourselves. <laughs> you know, we get justice. You know, I I think it's more of something, and again, this is just me, is that the righteousness that we seek after is the righteousness that we can bestow on others, not the righteousness that we're going to get. Not, you know, because when we pay, pray for justice that we mean from other people, we're really calling down vengeance from God on those people. We just do it in nicer, you know, nicer terms, you know, but it's, I know that I know God that you're going to be just and you know do justice on the world, which we mean, except for in my square foot right here, <laughs> you know, Joe. Yeah, you think about that. What greater blessing is there than that you hunger and thirst for righteousness? You have been blessed by the Holy Spirit to have that hunger. Mm -hmm. um, and there are those well, that are totally disinterested and don't even think about it. And then there's those that are just indifferent about it, even though they're aware of it. You know, and if I said that, I'd rather yeah. have you hot or cold yeah. rather than lukewarm. lukewarm. Yeah. You know, and all of that hunger and thirst isn't something we build up in us. It's what power of the Holy Spirit. Power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, and so people who aren't 
I don't want to say this in a judgmental way, but people that don't hunger and thirst aren't tied into the Holy Spirit. Now I'm talking about unsaved people who don't have that connection with the Holy Spirit. People don't recognize if they're hungry or thirst, and that's another, you know, that's another thing. Because they maybe they just don't recognize it, you know. Well, they're hungry and thirst, but they're looking in all the wrong directions. Well, yeah. No, and that goes back to what we were talking about first, how we try to, how we try to cover it, you know. So he says, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Um, uh, and in fact, I got in your notes there, not their own righteousness, but Jesus' righteousness imputed to you. We're righteous because God has declared us righteous. You know, when it says that Noah, what did, what did it say that uh, Noah and Enoch and whoever else, you know, they were right in the sight of God or they were righteous in the sight of God. They weren't perfect people. They were declared righteous mm -hmm. in, in God's, you know, in God's sight and God's view. It's just a declaration of that, you know, of that righteousness. And righteousness sometimes is just being in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. Um, being the being that you're meant to be. You know, so... Let's see. Um, let me see. But he said, for they shall be satisfied. How many people are satisfied? You know, I mean, what does satisfied mean? We can't get any satisfaction. I'm sorry? We can't get any satisfaction according to well, in fact, I've got the lyrics. I got the lyrics right here because no, because you know, is uh, you know, Simon and Garfunkel said, you know, um, the words of the prophet are written on the subway walls. I mean, that people are so open with the universal problems or the universal solution, they write it on the subway walls. You know, and we don't we don't recognize it. And the same thing with the Rolling Stone here, Rolling Stones, the Strolling Bones. You know, not as, but you know, is it's the lyrics are they're really good. You know, he starts out, I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction because I try, I try, I try, I try. I can't get no. I can't get no. So he's talking about the way he thinks you get the satisfaction is by trying, and that's what we're taught in life. You know, if anything else, you make your own satisfaction. You know, you do the things you got to do so that you are satisfied. He says, when I'm driving in my car, who here can sing? No. <laughs> when I'm driving in my car and the man comes on the radio, he's telling me more and more about some useless information supposed to fire my imagination. You know, is that people are trying to tell you or sell you, you know, the advertising in that, you know, is that people have a product and the advertisement is to create the need for the product. You had no idea that you needed that right nostril inhaler, you know, <laughs> until, until you saw it as a Super Bowl ad and go, I've got to get me one of those. I don't know what it's going to do, but it's going to make me happier. Otherwise, they wouldn't have made a commercial or a product for it. And so this is the kind of stuff that goes through our head that we we just by nature allow. And, and how many here have said, oh, well, I don't buy their product just because I hear it on the radio? You know, yeah, you do. Or somebody does because it's they've bought a year's worth of radio time, you know, to do it because they know that it increases their sales. You just have to hear it enough you know, enough times. Well, I think the answer to satisfaction comes from that manufacturing quote, how much is enough? That's right. Just a little just more. Just a little more. It's always just a little more. How much money do you have to make? One dollar more. You know, and, and we got, so he says, I can't get no, oh, no, no, no. Hey, hey, that's what I say. I can't get no satisfaction because I try and try. He goes on like that. He says, when I'm watching my TV and the man comes on and tells me how white my shirts can be, but he 
but he can't be a man because he doesn't smoke the same cigarettes as me. <laughs> I, I mean, this is all, again, you know, it's like, um, what was the guy's name? Solomon. Remember King Solomon? You know, there's a guy who couldn't get no satisfaction. What do you have, 300 wives and 700 concubines? And couldn't get any peace anyway. But, but, what did, but what did he say? He said, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And then he was talking about, there's nothing new under the sun. And where's under the sun? Here. Yeah, it's not, it's not heaven. It's not in some far by and by. He's saying, here on earth, it's all vanity. I mean, it, none of it is worth, I'll say a hill of beans. No. Plug. What's that? Plug nickel. Yeah, plug, not worth a plug nickel, mm -hmm. you know? And so the, I mean, so the point is, is that Jesus is saying for those, is it, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will have satisfaction. Blessed are they. Blessed are they. That's right. You know, and we don't know how that will work out. We don't know. Well, we do know how that will work out. Well, it will work out right. Because we've got <laughs> extracted from this, we will be in. Right. We will be righteous with Christ. Okay? And it's all that will disappear. But we know that, that these people know that. No. That's the sad part. Yeah, well, Call yeah. from potential fun. Okay. Call from potential fun. Let me, I'm going to mute you, Howard. I, oops. I think I muted her, Jeff. Anyway, um, so, uh, well, that made me lose my train of thought. <laughs> What is the righteousness we we don't achieve? It's given to us by virtue of our ascension yeah. to be with Christ. And somehow that will bring us satisfaction. satisfaction. The peace. Now we should write a song about that, Been a pastor. Let's sing about song three. So we we lack nothing. So because we have a good shepherd who cares for us, we're satisfied. We're content with, with his gifts that he gives us. But I was thinking of the, the Psalm 23 with the sheep, you know, the green pasture, still water, and think, do the sheep, do they think that they're satisfied? Yeah. No, they just lack nothing, right? And it's really, yeah. that's our Christian walk as well. We may not appreciate everything that God gives us all the time, but as because of this righteousness, this this we're made right for God through Jesus. And we don't know it. Yeah, we just don't yeah. think about it even, but we we can be thankful for it. I watched a um a video clip, one of those reels, and the guy was saying um, it was really out of character because this guy's a really kind of a I mean, he's a comedian, but he's kind of a adult comedian, let's say. But he, but his thing was, he was saying, when you stop and think about it, now he used the word 50 years, but he says, up until 50 years ago, nobody in the world had a hot shower. But his point is, and no one ever hot showers were made, I'm thinking back 50 years, I had hot showers. But even if you said 150 years ago or 200 years ago, all those people before never had a hot shower. They never had the good benefit, joy, of whatever we get when you take a hot shower. He goes, and he's, so he's talking about today, and we don't even realize it. And he says, you know, you look at the, he goes, you look at the calor caloric intake that we have, that people never had before or never dreamed about having, the entertainment that we have, you know, today, just for the flipping on a button to, you know, to amuse ourselves and stuff like that. And he goes, but we don't even think about it. See, because we don't, just like what Pastor was saying, we don't even know that we're in that category or in that, you know, state. He says, but what do we do? He goes, we look at other people and we let the envy of looking at what the other people have take away from what we have. And I thought, Wow. 
I'm turning that guy off. <laughs> no, I mean, you think about it. I mean, all the stuff that we have, all the blessings that we I mean, put it in a spiritual sense. Well, you know, the rain falls on the good and the wicked. So they get the same, you know, they get the same kind of thing. You think of all the blessings that we have and we pay no attention to it. You know, all I know is that guy got new tires on his car and I need new tires. You know, and, th and then it ruins our day, you know, doesn't it? I mean, it just it just ruins our day when stuff like that, you know, when stuff like that happens, you know. And then you, I hope he gets a flat on those new tires. I hope they, I hope they, I hope they didn't tighten all the lug nuts tight enough, <laughs> you know. But that's who we are, and that's why we need direction from Jesus that says no. This is who you are, and this is the blessing that you have, and this is the reward that you'll, you know, it's already got your name on it, just waiting, just waiting for you. But you have to be satisfied within yourself. That's where you get the satisfaction. Right. Yeah. Because you can look at half of the people, yeah. and they're better off than you are. That's yeah. What what right. You, you, I, I've always heard the definition of satisfaction is to be content with what you got. You know, just to be just to be content with now, as we get older, we grow into that because we've already had. You know, I tried to tell my boys one day, probably all three of my kids, but remember telling my boys one day is don't be grabbing for the big house and the fancy car and stuff like that. Um Put your money away. <laughs> but I had to tell them. But I've had the big house and I've had the big cars. I don't need them. Right. <laughs> no, no. So now you need to put money away to support me. But yeah, but you know, because a lot of times we're just not content with what we have. You know, the um, $300,000 Ferrari. Can you get them that cheap anymore? Anyway, it's going to take you to your destination just like your $5,000 used car is going to get you to the, you know, get you to the destination. Hopefully if it doesn't break down. You hit you know, on something uh, with the first two up there when you began that, that, that struck me. And that, that is, you know, people will ask the question, well, why, why do bad things happen? Mm -hmm. Well, part of the answer is how do you know what is good? If you don't know what is bad. Yeah. So in other words, if you have never experienced a loss, how can you have any regret? Because yeah. you've got everything. You know, you know what I'm saying? You've got no measuring tool to determine what the difference between bad and good really yeah. are. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's a matter of our perspective in life. Are you going to say something? This is the Olson's last week here, I think. So. Yes, you. I keep taking one in my head here. It says, one day, don't worry, one day you're going to be nervous. <laughs> like you said, with the hot fire of one. <laughs> Very one day. <laughs> anyway, okay, let's, um, <laughs> let's move on. He says in verse 7, finish, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Who here is merciful? You know, I bet you, I bet you, some people here are a lot more merciful than others. It's just a gift that you have. It's a you know, if you read through in Corinthians and Romans, and it talks about the gifts of the Spirit, you know, is you know, you read through those, and you go, "That's not me." You know, I, I, I don't, I don't think of myself. I don't know about the merciful part, but um, you know, of caring about other people carrying in the manner of being on the lookout for people who have you know needs i'm not good at that at all you know like i'm the one who walks the straight line keep what's in my view my bowl on my plate and other you know my, my wife will say to me you know did you see how that person was really sad or that person was really hurt i go no <laughs> no no it, 
You're insensitive. <laughs> no, right. Well, no, no, no. What I'm saying is, so what it says, blessed are the merciful. I imagine that there's a lot of people. I'm not saying nobody has shows mercy, but I'll bet there's a lot of people that are a lot more merciful than others. You know, uh, just the way that we're, you know, the way that we're different. I've been asked, I've told this before, I think I've been asked over the years, you know, why I'm not a pastor. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm an administrator and a teacher. Those are my gifts. And they're listed in the, you know, in the, um, you know, in the scriptures. I don't have a pastor's heart. You know, I can stand up here and teach. You know, hey, somebody comes to me and starts crying their woes to me. It's like, wow, oh, man, I think you got to slit your wrists. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not quite, I'm not quite that bad, but, <laughs> but pastor wouldn't think of that. I mean, it wouldn't even cross his mind. I'm, I'm just saying, you, you, if you're gifted by God, you're good at what you do. And so to try to pigeonhole your way into something that you're not part of your, on your gift you watch some people they have the gift of there's a gift of hospitality you know and we can see it mostly with the women in the church but i mean there comes a need for something man they just jump in and they do all that thing that are going to make whether it be at a funeral or whether it be like for something for you know today or whatever it is they just know how to make things happen to be hospitable to the church and the outside world that comes to the church or um you know whatever so I hope I didn't disappoint you, but don't come to me with your problems. <laughs> but we also so tend to be, you know, pessimistic. In other words, is is this a scam or is this person really in need? <laughs> you know, and yeah, no, no. should we be judgmental? Uh, this is a tough area, stereo. Yeah. Well, I'm good at giving people money because when I get some okay, I did my I did my part, you know, but, you know, people say, well, you know, that guy he could be out buying booze with it. <laughs> if I was living on the street, I'd need a drink too. <laughs> Wouldn't you? I mean, you know, it may not be the best thing. You want to be an enabler. <laughs> Here, go buy your drugs. <laughs> no, I know. Here, I bought you a hamburger, but I didn't put cheese because I didn't want to make you a glutton. I mean, you know, where do you where do you draw the line? You know, stuff like that. But anyway, he says, "Blessed are uh, the merciful, for they shall be mercy." And I have on your notes there: Does Jesus have regard for the weak? And in the Psalm forty one, it says, "Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers them." You know, the mercy is there you know, for the people to receive. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Um, you know, I've gotten your notes. So only those with a pure heart and clean hands have access to God. Ooh, who here has got that pure heart and clean hands? But we do, because God has made our heart pure. <laughs> In that Psalm 24, he says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, he who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. All of a sudden, now there's some definition to what are these clean hands and pure heart. You know, maybe it doesn't have to be pure, pure in all aspects, but as... Uh, uh, what does it says? Who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Maybe that's good enough. A deacon. The operatory. I've really started paying close attention right. as we sing the words in there. Right. Power. Right. Very Created me a clean don't, heart, oh Lord. Don't, don't take this away from me. Yeah. Give me. Thank you. Yeah. Now, see, we sing that because it's kind of a church jingle. Well, it's more than that, but I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, I get, but David's writing this at a time that he's going through certain situations and he recognizes who he is. I mean, remember, he's a man of blood and he's God's man of blood. We got to keep that in mind, too. No, seriously, he's God's man of blood. And, um, but he still knows his shortcomings and he still knows that he has. A wicked heart, at least in his own eyes, and he's crying out to God, creating me a clean heart. 
Do you mind fun? He could be content yeah. in his riches. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, so we're blessed with a clean heart because Jesus says we are. I mean, that's as far as we can go with that. Jesus says we have a clean heart. We're we're blessed with that. Um, you know, in our world today, to have a clean heart is to quit smoking, keep your cholesterol under control, don't eat too much red meat. You know, and that's gonna and that's gonna that's gonna improve your heart. <laughs> Uh, so, um, blessed are the peacemakers. I'm watching the time. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Um, uh, peace, you know, I got there. Peace is God's shalom. You know, and shalom, it's more than just peace, and it's more than just hello and stuff like that. It is a oneness with God. You know, and that's what you're... That's what you're, when you say shalom to someone, you're like wishing that oneness with God on them. You know, so, you know, a lot of times we don't know the definitions of words that we use in our common, you know, in our common language, you know, like that. But something like shalom, you know, means something very, you know, very particular. What's aloha mean? I love you, hello, and goodbye. Yeah. No, but the I love you, right? That's one. Yeah, no, I'm done the same. You know, so I mean, there's more, because we think aloha, you know, get out of here. No. <laughs> we, we just aloha, think. I love you, aloha means hello, yeah. aloha means goodbye. Yeah. Well, shalom means. I, shalom is yeah. one. Well, well, shalom is, you know, it's a greeting of hello, and it's a greeting of adios, you know, like that. So, yeah, and so, and it's funny how we hang on to words like, you know, words like that, because we know that they have a meaning, you know, versus when you tell somebody good day, what do you, what do you mean? Other than good day, it's, you know, just a throw, it's just a throwaway, it's just a throwaway term. No bad days in yeah, that's right. I saw that on people's cars. Like, that's how I know. Because the words of the prophet are written on the bumper stickers. <laughs> so anyway, so that peacemakers, it's forgiveness and reconciliation between Christians. It's to share the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. I don't think we know when we say that something transcends, you know, all understanding that it transcends all understanding, even our own understanding, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. So I've got there the um, first John 3 passage see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. That, that, that is so important yeah. that we're called the children of God, and so we are. It's not a, it's not an imitation. Would you like to be the children of God? If God calls you the children of God, you are. Right? The reason why the world does not know us is they didn't know him. So if you ever wonder why people don't understand Christians, it's because they don't know Christ. I mean, it's impossible for them to know. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So hope in God is faith. So if you go back up to blessed are the peacemakers, it's all wrapped up, you know, in that. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And again, there's that. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven, like it's a, you know, a present tense. But he says, blessed are those who are persecuted. Jesus is telling them, you're going to be persecuted. So be ready, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, remember this one thing, that this is a persecution for righteousness. 
not about being persecuted for being a jerk. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are persecuted because they're jerks. You know, they're just annoying to people and disruptive. You know, they think that they're doing something for God. And what they really are is they're turning people, you know, turning people off. So and I don't want to get into who's who and stuff like that, but I'm just saying. But it's for righteousness. Um, you know, and Jesus was persecuted for our sin. And you can look at it in a way, it was persecuted by us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So let's see. Blessed will finish that. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Now remember, it's got to be that they're um, you know, persecuting against you falsely on his account, not because of something you're doing, but because. They're mad at Jesus. And that's who, pardon? They're rejecting, they're rejecting Jesus. They aren't mad at us. They're mad at Jesus. Um, if they hated Jesus, they'll hate, you know, they'll hate us. So, you know, walk up to a stranger. You don't even have to be a jerk to do it. But walk up to a stranger. You know, if you're, I remember you used to sit around in malls, you know, the wife's were in the store. But you sit around the malls and you sit on a bench and you go, Hey, I was talking to a friend of mine about Jesus the other day. What do you think of Jesus? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no telling what kind of incoming fire you'll get. Right? You know, a problem, a problem in the military right now is a chaplain. Mm -hmm. Try to preach Jesus as the only way as a military chaplain today. I mean, you, you get all kinds of grief, you know, over it. Like that. But it's not because who doesn't like the chaplain, but Hey, it's not politically correct or whatever you want to say to preach the exclusivity of Jesus, Ray. Well, I was watching this thing on the internet, and I'm not sure if this is staying. It's sort of a map of the street. Let me ask the people as they walk by, do you believe in Jesus? And they said no. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't. I don't know if they answered no because they didn't want to get involved or they didn't know what the next person no, was. They, you know, they answered no. You're, you're, yeah. I've watched stuff like that before. The only thing you don't know is the way that it's edited because maybe a hundred people said yes before that guy said no. And then every time someone said no, that's what ended up in the video. With all those people that said no, mean no. And there's a whole bunch of them. There's a whole bunch of them out there. So... Yeah. What was fascinating about that video is there was one guy who actually became violent mm -hmm. at the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay. Makes you wonder what demon he had. Yeah, right. No, exactly. You know. So anyway, so um, he says, rejoice and be glad. Um, and that shouldn't be something that's new. Uh, and, you know, there's persecution all over the place. You know, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You read the Old Testament. You read about all the prophets. You read a book like, um, I can't remember the name, Fox's Book of Martyrs, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and you read about all the persecution that all the people went through, uh, all the punishments that they um that they that they went through um it's just it's there and, if, and what makes them so special that we shouldn't end up in the same way now we're lucky i mean we live here and um you know we don't have we don't have persecution we have things that we don't like or things that people say or do that we don't like or restrictions that we fall under but you don't have people knocking on your door in the middle of the night and hauling you off to the jail. It's getting there. Not uh, this year. Anyway. Pardon? Not this year. Well, no, no, but I'm, but I'm just saying, you know, but we've said that for a long time. I mean, you know, people have done that. And I, see, my thought has always been, you know, in those countries where that does happen and it happens violently, it's because those people doing the persecution, they care. In America, yeah, they may care wrongly, but they care. In America, nobody cares. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I mean, everybody's just mentally and spiritually lazy. You know, it's just, 
you know, as long as my cable TV is working, I don't care what you're saying out on the street and things like that. So a lot of times they just, they just don't, they don't care. Okay, so, but anyway, uh, the persecution is out there. Anyway, and that last one I have on here is what I started with. The Beatitudes are all gospel. We who are in Christ, um, the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is pretty much law, what God demands of us, okay? When he starts out in the next verse, it says, you know, about being salt and light. That isn't a matter of he's saying, you know, blessed are you who are salt and light, for yours shall be the shaker. No, I don't know. <laughs> you know, no, he's not doing that. He's telling the people that they're not salt and light. He's saying, you're doing it wrong. And this is how you need to do it. So that it, it all shifts, you know, like that. For the rest of, you know, for the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Probably the only part that may not be there is in chapter six when he gets into the Lord's Prayer and they go to teach us to pray. And he says, you know, pray like this. And then we do the, you know, do the Lord's Prayer. But you all know that the Lord's Prayer is in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, you know, we talked about last week how important the Sermon on the Mount is. And here, I mean, the Lord's Prayer is in there. You know, so. Any last questions? Ray does. Oh, the pastor does too. Uh, as to what would we do if we started to get persecuted for our religious beliefs? Hmm. Well, it depends what the persecution is. I mean, if it's just somebody saying, you know, I hate Christians, or if they have like the demonstrations on the college campuses now, and even if they say death to America or death to Israel, or if they say death to the Christian faith, uh, does it does if it doesn't go any further than people holding placards and shouting, you know, you know who you know I, I don't want to say who cares, but I'm just saying I don't know is that persecution or is that just people venting the um, pastor? Well, you you rank higher than him. Okay. Oh, okay. Joe. When I first started working in the aerospace industry, there was always a Christian Bible study available at lunchtime mm -hmm. or the other thing. And eventually it came where they companies, because of the pressure put on them from the government, you had to quit those. And then it got to the point of where if you even tried to share your faith with somebody else at work, you would be chastised for it. Even on non-work time? Even on non-work well, time. I'm, I was talking more of the Bible study. As long as you could sell any property, yeah. you could not share your faith. And yeah. that's you've got to learn. Yeah. That's persecution. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, a lot of times we just, we're under the good graces, and then we think when those good graces that are taken away, that that's I mean, it, it, it could be. I don't know. I mean, you know, a company can do what it wants. I mean, because it's there. It commands you to go and make disciples and share your faith. Right. Then when you run into a group that prevents you from being allowed to do that, that's correct. Well, but that would be like me walking into a company and start preaching while they're trying to work. Well, there's a difference between this. Problem no, I know. No, no, I, I, I know what you, I, I know. No, I know what you're saying. I just don't know that. I, to us, is that thing. To us, that's persecution. To people that are being that in the Middle East that were being nice. hauled off to jail and having their heads cut off, that might be a little bit, a little bit like. Okay, pastor's got another topic. Well, just, just with that, you know, if, you, if if you offer the opportunity for that, then you have to offer the opportunity for the Satan to come at the yeah. workplace, at the school, or. For things, so that's the argument. Is it free speech? Is it anyone can do it? But I want to uh, say thank you, Mary, for your wonderful yeah. desserts and treats. And so the donuts, the donuts, there's donuts there that came late. Uh, a guy worshipped here in the past year. His name is Jeffrey. He wanted to send them for Mother's Day, but he sent them too late. But we enjoyed ours. Yeah. And the donuts from the donut post, if you want to take extra dessert for Mother's Day, yeah. there's two boxes of uh, donuts there. 
Okay. It's good. <laughs> Look at Dave, he's all ready. Yeah. You know. Jeffrey. Yeah. You know, one very last thing is, you know, the, like the reason, see, I'm not for bringing prayer back in school because I don't want some Muslim up praying, you know, it, it, they can pray in their own groups. Right, right. But whenever people say, what we need to do is bring prayer back in school. No, what they mean is we need to bring Christian prayer back in school. <laughs> You know, but you can't, you know, you can't do that. Okay, we're done. We went, we went long instead of short today. Let's close with prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Very good.